Despite all his rage, he's still just Nicolas Cage. Despite all his rage, he's still just Nicolas Cage. And someone will say his career can never be saved. Despite all his rage, he's still just Nicolas Cage. Welcome to Just Nicolas Cage, where I very slowly work my way through Nicolas Cage's filmography. And today I'm talking about the 2001 historical romance war film Captain Corelli's Mandolin. Captain Corelli's Mandolin is set on the Greek island of Kefalonia in the 1940s, and it follows Nick Cage as an Italian soldier who's dispatched there, and he stays with a local doctor and his beautiful young daughter who's engaged. They start a will-they-won't-they of forbidden love, but what's gonna happen when Italy surrenders and the Nazis are none too pleased? So Captain Corelli's Mandolin was adapted from a novel written in 1994 by Louis de Bernier. It was a very successful book, I mean you know you've made it when Hugh Grant is reading your book at the end of a rom-com. But over the years the book has been criticized for inaccuracies and questionable depictions of historical events. And in fact, despite the author having said that Captain Corelli isn't based on a real person, there was a guy named Amos Pampoloni, who in real life was captain of the Aki division in Kefalonia, who had a relationship with a Greek girl, and he survived execution from the Germans. Exactly like Corelli in the book. And even he's heavily criticized the book, saying that the depiction of Greek partisans in the book is a pack of lies. I can't speak to the historical accuracy of the novel, but there is a bibliography acknowledgement page at the end to show that the author did his research. Wait, one of the sources is a book by Nicholas Gage? What are the odds? And who edited the book? Nicholas Page? So I read the book Captain Corelli's Mandolin recently, and I also had issues with it. I mainly just found the book to be a very taxing and inaccessible read most of the time. I mean, it took all of my mental fortitude to finish this book, especially getting through those early chapters. But I kept thinking, do it for your 180 subscribers. I did finish it, but full disclosure, there were chapters that I kind of skimmed through, and then afterwards I ended up going back and reading these chapter summaries from some website that I assume is intended for high school students. I think my biggest problem with the book is the pacing. I mean, this thing is slow. It's the kind of book that spends whole paragraphs describing the olive trees. But to really convey how slow it is, allow me to recap the first chapter. A doctor pulls a pea out of a man's ear. He goes home and he writes a few pages of a book. And the book is about like Greek gods and the history of Greece and we get to hear about it in lengthy detail. And then he leaves the room. And then when he comes back, a goat is eating his book and then he yells at his daughter. And that's the end of chapter one. It's not the most compelling opening to a story. And what doesn't help the pace is that the book is constantly jumping around in terms of narrative. And it's always like swapping characters' perspectives. Chapter 2 is essentially a stream of consciousness monologue from the POV of Benito Mussolini. There's other chapters where each paragraph is a different character's perspective. Like chapter 52 of the book is almost a collection of vignettes. I suppose that is kind of an interesting way to show you how World War II affected a variety of different people from different walks of life. But I just found the scattershot way that it jumped around pretty annoying to read. And this probably speaks more to my personal ignorance than being a universal criticism. But I was constantly looking up words I didn't know. Words like Eleusinian and Irredentism. I mean, thank God I was on the Kindle where you can just hold down the button and it tells you the definition. If I was reading this when it came out, I'd be back and forth with the dictionary. And there's also a lot of historical references that I didn't know, but the book assumed I did. Like, it does not ease you into the politics of the 1940s. There's a group called ELAS, which is a wing of EAM, which was controlled by a committee whose members were in the KKE. Oh, that explains a lot, thanks. But there's also sentences like this that they throw at you. I have written to Metaxas to commend his treatment of King Zog. The book assumes you know who those people are, but to me that sounds like something out of Star Wars. I have written to Metaxas to commend his treatment of King Zog. I did look up who those people were afterwards, obviously. I'm just trying to get across how jarring I found the historical element to it. But to be fair, I do think I learned quite a lot about history by reading this book. A pivotal section of the novel involves the massacre of the Yaqui Division in Kefalonia, which was one of World War II's most bloody prisoner massacres, in which over 5,000 Italian soldiers were executed, and around 3,000 more were drowned. That's such a brutal part of history that I knew nothing about prior to reading the book. And also, you don't often see the Italian side of World War II. And you especially never see what the Greeks were up to in World War II in movies. So that was kind of interesting. And there were other aspects of the book I appreciated. I like that it didn't pull any punches in its depiction of the brutality of war. There's a part in the book where an Italian soldier's penis freezes off so he shoots himself in the head. That is dark. I found the strongest sections of the book were from the point of view of a character named Carlo. He's a gay Italian soldier. He'd always felt like an outsider because he's gay. But once he's in the army, he feels more of 
of freedom because he's around the camaraderie of men. And then the reality of war kicks in and he becomes disillusioned with the Italian war effort. There's an excellent chapter about him where he's telling the mother of the soldier that he secretly loved about how her son died. And it's showing him saying these like sugar-coated lies to her. And then it like cuts to the reality of what really happened. Like the mother's like, please tell me my son died quickly. And Carlo's like, yeah, sure, he uh, took a bullet in the heart and didn't feel a thing. And then he tells the reader what really happened, which is that he got hit by a mortar shell, half his face blew off, and he slowly bled out two hours later. It's a very effective and moving chapter. And I also thought some other parts were very well written. I like the part about love being a temporary madness. And I will admit that after a shaky, difficult start, I did find myself getting caught up in the story after a while. And then I hated the last 100 pages. Some of the character resolutions just felt very rushed. A major character is killed very abruptly. And even the Corelli Pelagia story ends with a real anticlimax. The way it all wrapped up just felt very unsatisfying. But that's enough about the book for now. Let's stop talking about the page and start talking about the cage. I will say that production-wise, the movie does look very good. It was directed by John Madden. Wait, John Madden? Oh, John Madden. And the movie was actually filmed on the island of Kefalonia where it's set. Which is nice, I'm almost surprised that they didn't film it in LA or something. But I'm glad they actually did take the effort because the scenery looks beautiful. So in terms of the way they adapted the movie from the book, the movie is much more streamlined. There's an entire subplot that's cut out involving the character Mandras that I'll talk about more later. The time spent on the other villagers is largely reduced. And that great subplot I was talking about earlier with Carlo was cut entirely. Carlo is a character in the movie, but there's nothing about his homosexuality or what he went through or really anything that made him interesting in the book. He's just there. It does make the movie feel a lot more one-dimensional in comparison. I know I was complaining a lot about how the book kept jumping around with the characters, but after watching the movie, I do kind of understand why that was so important to the book. Those subplots do help to flesh out the story and the characters. I do get why a bunch of B-plots and sub-stories kind of wouldn't fully work in a two-hour long movie though. And that's why I think that the only way you could have really adapted this movie faithfully is by making it a mini-series. Because that way, like Game of Thrones, you could have full episodes where they're in a different country, and you could take your time developing that without interrupting the flow. So while the book feels like it's equally about love and war, the movie is a lot heavier on the love and really the melodrama. And I think the love story it tells is fine. There is always a little bit of a red flag when you tell a love story about a guy who's part of an army oppressing the country of the woman that he's trying to pursue. Because with a story like that, I think there's always going to be the lingering implication that she's only going along with it because of the position she's in. She's in that submissive position of power opposite a soldier from a fascist regime. It's kind of like when you hear about aspiring actresses who sleep with big shot Hollywood producers. And some even say that it was consensual at the time, but there's always the implication. Because if the girl said no, then the answer obviously is no. No. But the thing right. is, is she's not gonna say yeah. no. She would never say no because of the implication. But I'm not really getting implication vibes here. I mean, I don't love that the movie shows Corelli and Pelagia consummating the relationship, because in the book it goes out of its way to explicitly say that they don't ever have sex, which makes the relationship feel a lot more pure. But at least both characters do appear to be genuinely in love. And I never got the impression that Corelli was exploiting his position of power. In my reviews, I often bring up the Nicolas Cage movie Time to Kill. I mean, I usually shoehorn it in as an example of a Nicolas Cage movie that I hated. But I don't think there's ever been a more fitting time to bring it up than here. Because in Time to Kill, Nicolas Cage also plays an Italian soldier who's in occupied Ethiopia. And he rapes an Ethiopian woman and pretty much faces no consequence. So in the category of Nicolas Cage movies where he plays an Italian soldier that lusts over a woman from the country that his army is occupied, yeah, Captain Corelli's mandolin is definitely the more tasteful of the two of them. I already talked about how the movie is more concerned about love than it is with war. But World War II and its historical context is still an important part of the movie. There's a lot more exposition in the movie that kind of holds your hand about what's going on at the time about World War II. It does kind of spoon feed to you who the key politicians were and what they were doing. Like there'll be a radio announcement going, This just in, Metaxas, who by the way is the Prime Minister of Greece as opposed to the book where it takes for granted that you know who these people are. So the movie definitely dumbed it down, but as a dumb guy, I kind of appreciated that. And also the depiction of the Aki Division Massacre is very effective. They certainly don't skimp on the explosions, but it is very brief and it's a lot less brutal than it is in the book. Another quibble I do have about the way it was adapted is that the movie is almost entirely in English. 
despite it being about Greek and Italian people in the 1940s. I mean, Chernobyl is a great example of a good show that didn't go for the realism with the language. It's a show set in Russia, where they all have posh English accents. But I would rather watch Jared Harris give an amazing performance than maybe a Russian actor give a lesser performance. But language is such a crucial part of Captain Corelli's mandolin in the book. Like when the Italians first invade, Greeks use the language barrier to get around making fun of the Italians and Mussolini. And more importantly, the language gap between Corelli and Pelagia is a constant reminder that the two of them are from two different worlds. And as for the accents in the movie, well... <laughs> Anyone who says that Donizetti is better than Berdi <laughs> shall be required to sing Faniculi Fanicula and other songs about railways. Captain Antonio Corelli, 33rd Regiment Artillery, reporting for duty! I mean, by no means am I an expert at dialects, but to me it sounds very cartoonish. If I do that, I'll start getting confused about when I'm supposed to come in. And that, in a concert hall, would be a disaster. I mean, who was Nicolas Cage's accent coach? Uh, what about the accents? Is it... is it too much? Too much? It's a perfect! Wahoo! Okay, I'm gonna trust you. It is pretty funny, though, unintentionally so. Especially when the Cageisms mix with the Italian accent. Quick, get the gun. Somebody shoot him, shoot him! <laughs> But laughable accent aside, it's not an awful performance. And after a while, I think either the accent toned down or I just got used to it. Nicolas Cage did actually learn how to play the mandolin for the movie, which is commendable. And he also sings a lot in it, which I always like. And at one point, him and his fellow Italian soldiers sing the same song that he sang at the start of the movie he did right before this, The Family Man. <laughs> David Morrissey's accent also took me out of the movie a little bit. He plays a Nazi and his German accent kind of goes in and out. And half the time it does kind of sound like he's speaking in his normal English accent. All my family and my family before them, going back as far as we can remember, have dark hair on my own. In the bath. <laughs> Which would be fine if everybody else was doing English accents. But I think in a movie where everybody else is really going for it, you need to really drive home that the German guy is German. But his performance is fine once you get over that. Christian Bale is in this movie. When I was reading the book, I knew that Christian Bale was going to be in the film, but I didn't know what character he was. And then I got to the part in the book where this character comes back from the war looking all emaciated and skinny, and then later in the book he has a distended belly, and I thought, I bet that's going to be Christian Bale. The man is committed to dramatic weight transformations. I will say this isn't Christian Bale's finest performance, but I guess opposite Nicolas Cage's accent seems perfect. I was kind of excited to see Christian Bale and Nicolas Cage be in the same movie together, because they're both actors that are known for fully committing. And when you think about it, Vampire's Kiss is kind of the sassy sister film to American Psycho, but Cage and Bale only share about two or three brief scenes together. Which is a little bit disappointing, I mean, imagine a meaty character study starring the two of them. But from what I can remember, I don't even think that Mandras and Corelli even meet each other in the book. So I guess I'm grateful that they even shared a scene at all in the movie. But as for another change from the book that I didn't like, they pretty much entirely cut out Mandras' character arc. In the book, he goes off and gets involved in this communist organization that's led by this, like, complete sadistic psychopath that takes pleasure in, like, subjugating the peasants and teaches Mandras that it's okay to rape a woman if she's a fascist. I do think that this is the part that a lot of Greek people took issue with, but I thought it was one of the more compelling parts of the book, especially because then Mandras comes back from there all brainwashed, and he calls Pelagia a slut and tries to rape her. Again, I do kind of get why they cut this subplot, it's another part that would work better in a TV show. But also losing that subplot makes the character feel one-dimensional compared to the book. Penelope Cruz I thought was quite good here, and I thought she had nice chemistry with Cage. Penelope Cruz was nominated for a Razzie for this movie. I don't think she deserves it at all, and I, I can't even really see where they're coming from with that one. Especially when Nicolas Cage's performance in the movie exists and he wasn't nominated. But the person in the movie that comes out with the most dignity is John Hurt. Mainly because it's goddamn John Hurt. He went for the subtle approach with the accent which worked, and he's one of the better characters even in the book. He's a grumpy wise old doctor who delivers these profound speeches, and I will say that I much preferred how his storyline wrapped up in the movie than in the book. But outside of the ending, Louis de Barnier's novel is technically better than the movie in almost every way. Character development, historical relevance, and also in terms of expressing the key themes, like how love and beauty can thrive against all odds. That being said, I was a lot less bored while watching the movie than I was while reading the book. The streamlining of the adaptation is a double-edged sword. Like I said, you lose a lot of the depth and the intricacies, but it did make a more palatable experience. There are parts of the book that are masterful, but my general experience while reading the book was, oh god, this was boring. 
When's it gonna be over? This chapter is pretty good, actually. Huh. Oh god, it sucks again. With the movie, I was consistently like, Yeah, this is okay. This is alright. <laughs> look at Nicolas Cage's accent. Yeah, it is alright. Yeah. And it is kind of hard to decide which one of the two is the better experience. The 500 page book with a lot of lows but a few highs. Or the two hour long movie that's kind of a flat line of mild amusement. So overall, the movie Captain Corelli's Mandolin is serviceable and very beautiful looking. But ultimately pretty cheesy, shallow, and generally unremarkable. Don't look to it for much historical depth or even much emotional depth. It's not a good adaptation of a book, but I think that would have annoyed me more if I liked the book more. But I didn't hate this movie. But also, outside of Nicolas Cage's Super Mario accent, I don't think I'm gonna think about this movie ever again. So the next movie Nicolas Cage did is Christmas Carol the Movie. So until next time guys, thanks for watching.